Good evening, everyone. Nice to see you here. Really nice to see old colleagues, new friends in this marvelous place at the Queen's University in Belfast. I'm Alexandra Anders, members of the scientific committee of the EA annual meeting in Belfast. It's my honor to present to you today's keynote speaker, Zuzana Siklosi. Zuzana is an assistant professor at the Institute of Archaeological Sciences at Loránd University in Budapest in Hungary. She's an expert in the Neolithic and Copper Age of the Carpathian Basin and focuses on various social archaeological issues. Her MA dissertation on Neolithic Prestige Goods won a publication award. She received Arta's Promising Researchers Award in 2018. She is currently leading two major research projects. One of them aims to model the spread of early copper artifacts and the technology of metallurgy from South East to Central Europe. Additionally, she is the PA of the Momentum Innovation Research Group, which explores the factors that affected the spread of innovations with the goal of understanding the transmission of technological know-how and of which factors influenced these transmissions. Thanks to her multidisciplinary interest and cooperation network, her name is also well known among leading research institutes and labs. She is a very active member of the EA community as a presenter or session organizer since the meeting in Zadar in 2000. We have known each other for quite a long time. We are colleagues at the Institute and we have co-authored several papers and have co-edited various volumes. The situation of young female researchers is not easy anywhere in the world, but they have to, not easy in anywhere in the world, but they have to work particularly hard in Eastern Europe to break through the glass ceiling. Zsuzsa is one of the few who have been able to do so through her talent, determination, commitment to science and archaeology, and the warm support of her family. The keynote speakers are scholars who were selected to be representative of EAA membership, and because their fascinating areas of research span many aspects of the conference teams. This was the case with Zsuzsanna, too. The motto of this year AM is weaving narratives, telling stories about the past. Zsuzsanna's talk will demonstrate how we can write a perceptive narrative of individual communities and local diversity in the fifth millennium BCA. Zsuzsa, come and spread your news from the Copper Age. The stage is yours. Thank you, Alexandra this uh, very nice introduction. Dear colleagues, dear organizers, first of all, I would like to say thank you for the invitation. It is a, it is a great honor to give a keynote lecture here in Belfast. I'm very much grateful for the opportunity to present to you a new research group. We have already seen many exciting presentations today, and I hope our work, our work will also arouse your interest. The mere existence of an independent Copper Age has been debated among European, research, European archaeologists since the 19th century. The increasing number of pure Copper objects in European collections led some local researchers, mainly where raw Copper was available, to insert a new period between Thompson's Neolithic and uh, Bronze Age, the Copper Age. Ferenc Pulski's oeuvre fit, fits well into this European context. He argued for the existence of an independent copper age in 1883, based on copper and gold artifacts from Hungary and the then recently found Stolhof hoard. In the first half of the 20th century, the golden child linked the technological development of archaeological period and metallurgy, a craft specialization, to the rise of complex societies. According to Child's definition and narrative, archaeological cultures were analytical units 
and active agents of prehistoric processes. As we all know, in the second half of the 20th century, the new archaeology reformed the definition of archaeological culture and highlighted some of its basic conceptual problems. However, the notion is still widely used. Following the new paradigm, Connie Ranfew argued for an autonomous copper age in southeastern Europe, which emerged independently from the Near East. Renfrew based his idea on the exploitation of local sources of copper raw materials and the surprisingly rich, rich cemetery in Varna, supported by radiocarbon dating. At that time, this idea was revolutionary. He placed the spread of metallurgical innovation in an economic and social context and considered the large quantities of copper artifacts as prestige goods. He linked the beginnings and spread of metallurgy to the emergence of chiefdoms and social inequality. Renfrew believed that the production of metal objects required specialized craftsmen for which a society must be capable of surplus production and was controlled by chiefs. Processorist archaeologists focus on the study of individuals, identities, microhistories, and site centered studies from the 1980s. However, from this point, we must talk about parallel archaeologies, perspectives, and trends. Regional or macro scale investigations, which use the traditional definition of archaeological culture implicitly or explicitly, still existed. Almost 10 years ago, Christian Christiansen showed in an excellent paper that big data and the explosive development of scientific analytical methods, primarily the ancient DNA, led to a paradigmatic shift again in archaeological research. Thanks to these new methods, now we can see how small or large scale mobility as the Nautization or the Yamnaya impact reshaped the European continent's history. These analyses also frequently consider archaeological culture as an analytical unit. This approach has been widely and severely criticized. Big data, big stories, but individual decision, right history. Even the post protestual and biosocial archaeologies created methodology to, to study individual life ways, the different perspectives have, have been rarely applied together. The fact that we do not define what we mean by the spatial and temporal distribution of material culture is a basis of misunderstanding. We do not make a clear difference between the patterns of production, use and deposition of objects. We do not focus on interpersonal relations and differences in access to knowledge and information when we discuss the distribution patterns of certain elements of material culture. We also pay less attention to whether distribution pattern is equal to a certain social unit, and if yes, which unit it is. In my presentation, I will argue for the need to develop a multiscalar approach building from the smallest social units, the individuals, via the communities, and the local scale to the micro-regional and regional scale to understand how individual decisions lead to history-forming transformations. We need a multiscalar and integrative approach that uses, uses real social entities. The Copper Age was the age of innovations. This period saw the birth and spread of many historic technological innovations across Europe. These include the spread of metallurgy, the invention of the wheel, the wheeled vehicles and animal traction, the increased consumption of diary products and the processing of wool. Except for metallurgy, Andrew Sherrod de described them as the secondary products revolution. His theory has been refined since, since then. The emergence of these innovations did not occur together, but it is still, still true that eventually they were compiled into a package that shaped human history. 
So the question is how we can better understand the spread of these innovations and how we can detect individual decisions and real social interactions beyond them. The Carpathian Basin played a key role in the spread of these innovations because its geographical location provides a natural link between southeastern and central Europe. The Danube and its tributaries offer an excellent route for communication and transportation. The Great Hungarian Plain is the westernmost boundary of the Eastern European steppe, while Transdanubia is linked to Central Europe. Therefore, what is now Hungary is a natural linking point between large areas. Copper mines dated to at least 5,500-5,300 BC are known from present-day Serbia and Bulgaria. Targeted archaeometallurgical research has revealed many details about the local metallurgy and the organization of the production. Contrary to the previous assumptions, no special furnace was needed to smelt copper. A, lit a simple pit was sufficient. The key to the process was, co was cooperation. In other words, instead of individual spe specialization within the community and individual workshops, the entire community of the settlement participated in metallurgical activities. If we can talk about secret knowledge, it was a secret of the community, part of the community's identity. The social identity forming significance of metallurgy and copper objects is reflected in the groups of miniature anthropomorphic clay figurines excavated at Trikvines Dublina in Serbia. Recent multidisciplinary studies on the Varna Cemetery shed new light on Copper Age elite. The archaeometallurgical analysis of gold artifacts and the complex interpretation of anthropological studies have led to, to the conclusion that the graves, which are extremely rich in gold objects, including gold imitations of the goldsmith's tools, may have been the graves of goldsmiths. These people, could have been involved in not only the production of these objects, but also their exchange. In other words, it was the craftsmen themselves, rather than a separate elite, who organized the transmission of the objects they made. Briefly, we can see a differentiation of knowledge in the 5th millennium BC, a high-level specialized knowledge of craft craftsmanship appeared at several places throughout the continent and was accompanied by a long distance distribution of its products that can be regarded as prestige objects. Connie Renfew used the innovation of metallurgy as an example of his, of his famous paper in which he highlighted the importance of studying the spread of innovations. He implemented Everett Rogers' sociological study into archaeological research. In the last decade, research into innovations has become a leading field in archaeology. However, no complex model has been developed so far, which would integrate the results from different fields to explain why innovation and more broadly knowledge transfer has spread rapidly in some areas and slowed down and stalled in others. But social factors help or hinder the transfer of information and knowledge. Who and, and how creates those social networks through which innovation spreads and how are they maintained? One of the reasons for the lack of a comprehensive explanatory model is that archaeological research either focuses on the flow of information between individuals at the site level on the spread of significant innovation, innovations on a continental scale. This is because there is no methodological and theoretical framework that could connect the different levels and explain how human interactions between individuals became, become global historic events and how we can link this to the available archaeological record. In material culture studies, the Chen Operatoire approach has long been used to detect each step in the manufacture and reveal the skills and knowledge of the manufacturer. 
Using this methodology, we can trace the teaching and learning processes, the real interpersonal relations and communities of practice. Thanks to the wide range use of analytical methods, we, we now have the opportunity to reveal the traces of individual knowledge, skills, and their differences among, among individuals and communities as well. In what follows, I will demonstrate how different narratives can be created using such a multiscalar approach, building from the bottom up, instead of using the archaeological culture as a homogeneous analytical unit. Examples will be shown from the Copper Age of the Carpathian Basin. The cultural and chronological framework of the early and middle Copper Age in Hungary seemed to be clearly out outlined by the end of the 20th century. After the abandonment of late Neolithic tiles on the Great Hungarian Plain, a new fine material called Tisapolgar culture appeared around 4500 BC. It was accompanied by the appearance of the first former cemeteries and heavy copper tools, and by a dispersed settlement pattern. The Copper Age lasted until 4000 BC, consequently, it was both a cultural and a chronological period or unit. The fine material called Bodrokelestur culture seemed to be its immediate cultural and chronological descendant. It was represented by the appearance of gold ornaments and heavy copper tools in great amounts and accompanied by the continuous change of pottery forms and decorations. This chronological period the Middle Copper Age lasted until 3600 BC. Its second part was separated and called Hunyadi Halom culture, based on primary the changes of pottery. Moreover, this was the period when the first traces of local metallurgy appeared both on the Great Hungarian Plain and Transdanubia. The beginning of the Transdanubian Copper Age was not so was not such a profound change. The Lengyel complex survived, albeit with less intensity than in the late Neotic. The Middle Copper Age Balaton Lassinia culture was characterized by a dense network of small form like settlements and was as rich in metals as the Bodrog Keresztur culture on the Great Hungarian Plain. The second half of the Middle Copper Age is characterized by the sporadic settlements of the Furhenstig pottery culture with Central European relations, and there were traces of local metallurgy. This traditional culture historical perspective viewed things in terms of homogeneous spatial and temporary units as archaeological cultures, and it described their unilinear, uniform development on the whole Great Hungarian Plain and Transdanubia. The first signs showing problems with this system appeared in the 2000s, when large-scale excavations revealed two cemeteries. The fully excavated cemetery in Hajdubösser may Ficorito contained Tisapolgár-style pottery and was dated with EMS measurements to between 4350 and 4250 BC. Another cemetery in Rákóczi falva Bivajtó was discovered with uh, Bodrokeresztúr-style pottery gold and copper ornaments, and heavy copper tools. Its EMS dates were surprisingly old, dated to the same period. We can see that two cemeteries, which according to the traditional system, should have followed each other in time, might have been contemporary. Therefore, it was clear that we need to reconsider our conceptual frameworks to describe the Copper Age. Therefore, together with Pajarotsky, we took further EMS measurements and we interpreted them with Bayesian modeling. We found that the dating of the Tisapolgar style did not, did not change as much as the assemblages represented by Bodrog Keresztur and Hunyadi Halom pottery uh, style, which were dated to a much earlier period than it was expected before. The results suggested that the former system of successive phases of Tisapolgar and Bodrokeresztur cultures cannot be maintained anymore because these ceramic styles might have been partially contemporary. Therefore, 
are starting my postdoc research project in light of these new results in 2012, and I focused on three strongly related group of questions. The problem of dating, the space, and the problem of cultural and stylistic units. My colleague Martin Szilágyi joined me in this project, and his task was the systematic evaluation of pottery styles using a uniform statistics-based stylistic analysis. During this project, we built up our model from the smallest units, as graves or pits, via the sites to microregions and regions, and we built different contradictory models. We used altogether more than 100 AMS measurements in Bayesian modeling. If we study the use of deep, different styles in the context of space and time on the Great Hungarian Plain, we can witness a contemporaneity of different pottery styles and the continuous spread of the Bodro Kerestur style. It seems evident that what we call the Tisza Polgár style appears earlier than the Bodro Kerestur style. Based on these results, we can observe the contemporaneous use of various pottery styles at different sites on the Great Hungarian Plain, instead of homogeneous units of archaeological cultures. The picture becomes more complicated by the fact that it is usually not easy to make a difference between the Tisza Polgár and Bodro Keresztúr styles. Instead, a mixture of different proportion of the elements occurs on several sites. Based on Bayesian models, the Bodro Keresztúr style appeared 130 to 230 years earlier on the Great Hungarian Plain than the Tisza Polgár style disappeared. Due to the multi-level modeling, we can even see the spread of Bodro Keresztúr style on the plain. We can witness the variability of styles in material culture, mortuary practice, and settlement pattern in a, region, in a regional level on the plain. The regional homogeneity as Tisza Polgár and Bodro Keresztúr cultures cannot be maintained anymore in a time interval that can be studied nowadays. Moreover, the first appearance of a steppe origin barrier makes this picture even more colorful. An important consequence is, is that if we try to maintain the regional unit of archaeological culture, it would hide the variability that we can currently witness in the use of material culture. I think that we can find traces of overlapping complex social networks of individuals forming communities behind this variability in the material culture and archaeological features, and this is a much more realistic picture. We can recon reconstruct the life of past communities only if we try to reconstruct the real significant social unit at every level, and we try to reconstruct their social networks and social interactions. Every community is built up of individuals with multiple and multiple level identities as age, gender, kinship, rituals, and so on. These communities can be formed on a local level or on the basis of interactions between individuals who are connected with some common features. Therefore, we cannot expect that we will be able to reveal clearly separated units by this, but this complex, subtle network of social relations can be explained by the mosaic variability of archaeological data. In the following, I will show this complexity using the example of the board of um, the Rákóczi Falva Bivajtó site 1C. A settlement of three buildings and several pits and a contemporary cemetery of 79 graves was revealed. Both were totally excavated and there was a dividing empty space between them. This fortunate situation provided us a unique opportunity to study how material culture was used in various archaeological contexts. A single barrier was found in the settlement, contemporary with the oldest graves in the cemetery. At first glance, 
The barrier right is identical to that seen in the cemetery, but the left side laying is a female characteristic, by the, while the long Volhynian flint blade is a male characteristic. Anthropological studies revealed that the deceased was an adult male. It is striking that the decoration of the pottery, pottery grave goods is of excellent quality, which makes them more similar to the settlement pottery. Even if we do not know exactly why this person was buried in the settlement instead of the cemetery, it is certain that the rules of the community made this situation possible. Two spatial groups can be distinguished in the cemetery. The western group is the older one, the eastern group is a little younger. The whole cemetery's use can be estimated for 130 years at most. Among the grave goods in the older group, both Tisapolgar and Bodrocker restore styles, and even a Scheiben Henkel type plastic, plastic decoration occurred. All three graves with pottery of different styles can be dated between approximately 4350 and 4250 KBC, which can be explained either by a sudden change in the use of pottery styles, or these styles were used contemporary, at least in a scale that we can detect now. One of the richest graves was a symbolic one. It was found in the center of the Western group, surrounded by an empty area. The grave contains all significant symbolic objects but gold. The Balkan copper axe, the special Balkan bifacial leaf point, the long Volhynian stone blades indicating long distance connections, and the triangular arrowheads and milk jug are typical of local barriers on the Great Hungarian Plain. We interpret this grave as a symbolic representation of the community's relationships. The differences between the use of material culture at the settlement and the cemetery is striking. The quality of the vessels, the forms and their frequencies are different in the settlement and the cemetery. The so-called milk jacks were mostly placed into the graves and hardly deposited in the context of the settlement. In contrast with the 18 copper artifacts and further gold ornaments found in the cemetery, no trace of metallurgical activity was revealed in the settlement. Based on the chemical composition and lead isotope analysis, the objects were made of high purity copper ore driving from the Balkan mines. According to Norbert Farago, the few nap stones found in the settlement were made of local raw materials. Many nap stones from the cemetery could be associated with the Volhynian prude type raw material from 400 or 450 kilometers northeast of Rákóczi Falva. Further objects were made of obsidian or limnosilicite originating in the Tokaj mountains. An extraordinary piece, a bifacially retouched, ret retouched leaf point from the symbolic barrier was made of a Balkan flint originating more than 800 kilometers away from Bulgaria. The tools were most likely made elsewhere. During the evaluation and the refitting test of the Volhynian flint, traces of several nodules were found, but no conjoining pieces could be identified. This may prove that these pieces came together from the same workshop. Summarizing the results of the Rákóczi Falva case study, the difference between the settlement and cemetery's material was surprising. It is also striking how different identity types appear in the two contexts. Two well visible identities appeared in the cemetery. The smallest one, the individual, and an in as an interesting dichotomy, the largest one, because the cemetery was also the place of the most distant connections and the emergence of large identity groups. In contrast with it, the settlement seems to be a different world, a parallel reality, with a completely different dynamism. No distant connections or stylistic separation is observable in the settlement material. For us, however, 
the main lesson was the variety of almost all artifact types or phenomena. The concept of site history made all these observations possible. Top down modeling and using the concept of archaeological culture would have obscured much of this diversity. Going further from the site to the micro regional and regional level, we conducted a similar site based approach. And besides local variability, we also detected shared traditions. Style and decorations can be easily copied and rapidly changed. Esther Shonai started to analyze the ceramic fashioning sequences because these appear to be more resistant to change. Forming gestures become motor habits during the learning process, where the tutor and the learner are always socially related. Thus, the sets of technical traditions are shared and transmitted over time within socially related communities of practice. This is true for not only ceramics, but any other crafts. This is why the Chen Operator approach is the relevant methodology to reveal the learning processes and detect the set of skills and shared knowledge. Esther is an analyzing the Rakoci Fava bivital assemblages and other contemporary sites on the Great Hungarian Plain in her PhD dissertation. The frequent forming techniques that occur in large quantities on the sites refer to a common set of technical traditions that strongly defined the way of doing of the potters. The universal distribution of these techniques, independently from the ceramic styles, suggests a common social network. What is more, different, probably non-local traditions can be also detected on the site with Bodro Kerestur ceramic style. These indicate that the potters in these settlements might have had widespread social networks and diverse traditions. As we have seen, a dense network of small form-like settlements was established in the early Copper Age. These small-scale agropastoral settlements were, were economically self-sufficient. This suggests that there were close social ties between the inhabitants of the smaller settlements in a narrower geographical area, which determined that they were buried in the same place. It is also possible that communities change their residence frequently within a narrower area. The results of isotopic studies on individual diet do not show differences by gender and wealth, so a degree of social inequality that would have limited access to basic food sources is unlikely. According to strontium isotope analysis, the Tissapolger barriers of Hajdubösszörmé, Ficsorító and Pusztataskoi Ledence sites are of local origin. The barriers are in the Tissapolger Basatanya cemetery, accompanied by Tissapolger style pottery, are also essentially local. Here, however, the barriers with Bodrokeresztúr style pottery included several non-locally born male individuals. Additionally, several mobility patterns were observed. There were some who moved here as adults, some who had changed their residence several times during their lives, and others who were bo born here, spent their early childhood somewhere else, and they returned here. This suggests the diversity of individual life courses within a settlement, uh, within a cemetery's community. Individuals with greater mobility tended to have fewer grave goods than individuals with stronger local connections. This raises a question of the relationship between the mobility of individuals and the use and deposition of long distance objects. Could they have been the individuals who were involved in the transmission of long distance objects, perhaps in the transmission of technological know-how? No evidence of local metallurgy has yet been found in early Copper Age settlements on the Great Hungarian Plain, and the metal objects have been found typically as tray finds or as grave goods. The only find from a certain context that can be linked to the technology of metallurgy is a small plum-shaped copper ingot fr 
found in grave 59 of the cemetery at Tisztapolgár Basotonya, the grave of a 30-35-year-old woman with Bodo Kerestur style pottery. This find also questions the early and implicit assumption that only men were involved in matter working. This find suggests that social contacts with Balkan communities may have led to the sporadic transfer of information and technological knowledge. In 2017, I started a comprehensive project to investigate the origin of the raw material for the copper artifacts, whether potential sources in the Carpathian Basin were exploited, and whether there were differences in the use of sources between Transdanubia and the Great Hungarian Plain, and whether access to sources changed between periods. I will present its results tomorrow in another presentation. This time, I will only highlight some issues related to the topic of the analytical unit and the transmission of technological knowledge. According to the distribution of metal artifacts, the Bodrokerestur culture was thought to be a metallurgical center. I think that this, this interpretation misses the crucial difference between the consumption, deposition, and the place of manufacture. This is a typical problem when prehistoric archaeology uses the concept of archaeological culture. If we look into the details, we can find that the majority of the copper artifacts are, stra are stray finds without any archaeological context. Therefore, we cannot place them precisely in time and frequently, quite frequently, even in place. Moreover, the Bodrokerestur culture covers the plain, where there are no copper ore sources. This distributional map usually covers a wide range of typological forms of axes and edges, but from well-documented archaeological find context, only Yasladan and Shiria type edges are none. In these communities, only a very limited number of adult men could have had access to these artifacts. Therefore, the question should be what these communities could provide in exchange for long distance artifacts, including copper, gold, and stone artifacts. Returning to Transdanubia, another remarkable Example, we show as the long distance interactions and various expressions of identities of a Copper Age community. A unique Copper Horde was unearthed in 2017 uh, during a preventive excavation in the middle of south southern Transdanubia. Although similar hordes are none from Central Europe, there are either st stray finds or were discovered in the 19th, early 20th century, and little is known about their archaeological context. The discovery of the hoard from Magyar Egres represents an outstanding opportunity for studying the social role of copper hoards. The excavated part of the settlement reveals a well-organized settlement with north northwest, southeast oriented buildings, huge amorphous pits, an area of economic activity and an enclosure. Based on Bayesian modeling of EMS measurements, the site was used during the second half of the fifth millennium BC. The hoard was recovered from a port placed upside down at the edge of a large complex pit, pit complex. The pot contained two large spectacle uh, spiral pendants three large spiral bracelets, two of which fit together, intentionally cut into two halves. 19 spiral coins, cords, and more than 600 small copper beads, as well as almost 300 stone beads and one spondylus bead. The manufacture technologies, the manufacturing technologies were revealed by Esther Horvath. The Shen operator was highly standardized, and certain technological characteristics were shared in case of different types. Thin ornaments, such as cylindrical bits and tubular spiral cords, were made of a single copper sheet. Thick pieces, like bracelets and pendants, were constructed by 
stacking several copper sheets to create a laminate structure, which was then rolled or folded and curled into a spiral shape. The sheets were flattened and shaped by hammering. Standardization is reflected also by objects' shapes, cylindrical, tubular, and spiral forms occurred. Lead isotope and chemical compositional analysis suggest the probable northwestern Carpathian origin of the raw material. This is consistent with the archaeological data. Large spectacle spiral pendants are known from hordes or a stray finds in the territory of present-day Slovakia, the Czech Republic, and Austria. The very context of the large spectacle spiral pendants is unknown, as these artifacts were never found in graves. The objects that make up the hoard were probably made elsewhere, but may have arrived as part of a gift or prestige exchange between high-ranking individuals. No artifacts have been found in the settlement material that suggest local manufacture. The making of all the objects of the hoard requires a high degree of skill, and the objects must have been of high value. The Balkan and the Northwestern Carpathian Metallurgical Centers were different in the sense of product distribution. The objects from the Balkans reached long distances as far as the North Sea, while at least some special types made in the Northwestern Carpathians were only spread in a smaller area, which is called the Balaton Lassinia Ludanice Jordanov complex. This fact might might be due to the different operations of the centers and the different attitudes toward their product. This is where we were before our current project. Thanks to the generous funding of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences Landulet Momentum program, we could establish a new research group at the end of the last year. Following the above presented approach, we build models from the individuals to the local communities and larger micro and regional social networks. We study the interpersonal relations with the combination of ancient DNA, isotopes and material culture analysis on metals, stones and potteries. During this project, we pay particular attention to the archaeozoological material and the wide range of animal products. Using this integrative approach and social network analysis, we will be able to detect differences in access to raw materials, information, knowledge, and resources, and finally define a set of knowledge that a certain community shared. In summary, we found essentially local small-scale communities who maintained intense contact with other small-scale communities based on the objects they placed in their graves. There is a difference in prestige or rank. We can rule out the possibility of major population movements that might have played a role either in the beginning of the Copper Age or in the spread of metallurgy. Mobility is likely to, to have occurred only within the plain and over shorter distances. For these, small-scale Copper Age communities, it was essential to form alliances with other similar communities, to have access to additional resources, to avoid risk, and to reach stability. There were several ways of doing this. Organizing communal feasts, gifting of prestige goods, and building marriage relationships could all help to maintain and strengthen these alliances. The small-scale communities of the Copper Age were open, colorful, and diverse. The, the key to their stability and success was their diverse network of relationships. The coordinated cooperation, collaboration, and information that flowed between the members of these communities could also support creativity and the emergence or spread of new innovations. The results of this can be seen in the archaeological record. Thank you for your attention. And I would also like to say thank, thank you to my colleagues 
the members of the Momentum Innovation Research Group, with whom we would like to contribute not only uh, the investigation of uh, the copper age in the copper tea and basin, but also a wider European prehistory. Thank you.